Hi, this is Jose Luis, and welcome to another video in this series, Introduction to Parametric Modeling. In the previous videos, we have talked a lot about nerve geometry and curves and surfaces and all this, like the polynomial mathematical representation, blah, 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 like complex stuff. But we've actually kind of tiptoed over um, more simple fundamental forms of geometry that are at the core of all the geometry generations and all the geometry manipulation operations that we will be doing in parametric modeling. So I would like to take some time in this overall section in the next few videos to really take a closer look at simpler uh, geometrical entities such as vector planes, uh, numerical series and operations such as Euclidean transformations so that we can have a really, really ho good hold on how they can be used numerically to generate and to manipulate geometry and therefore um, make us stronger in the fundamental tools of computational geometry. Uh, so in this video, I would like to start with well, probably one of my favorite subjects, which is vectors. <laughs> and I would like to take a close look at what vectors are, how they're different from other entities and how we can use them for our advantage. So what are vectors? Vectors are typically represented in textbooks and in graphics, in, so in modeling environments, they're typically represented as arrows. And they're represented as arrows because as opposed to, for example, points, which are typically represented to, are typically used to represent location in three-dimensional space, vectors are entities that represent three things. They represent an orientation, in three-dimensional space, so they have some kind of angle in 3D space. They represent a direction, so not just the angle, but whether if they're pointing in one way or the other is also important. And then they also represent a magnitude or represent a length. So the same orientation and, and direction can be stronger or can be weaker, all right? But what they do not represent, and this is very important for us to understand, is they do not represent location in 3D space, okay? That's what points are meant for. And the idea is that this vector that I've drawn here, for example, would be the same as this one, would be the same as this one, and would be the same as this one, but it would be different from this one, or from this one, or from this one. These would be vectors that are not equivalent. So a vector is simply a magnitude in three-dimensional space that is pointing in some direction with some kind of strength, but can be represented in any place in three-dimensional space. That doesn't matter. Vectors are very commonly used to represent orientation and direction. They're very common, for example, in uh, force fields. They're really, they're really common, for example, when we work with magnetism, electromagnetism. And uh, they're also super, super important when we are working in computer graphics for the reasons that I will explain very soon. And how do we represent numerically vectors? Well, it's actually quite easy. So vectors are typically represented with three numbers. Let's say, for example, 2, 5, and minus 3, okay? And those three numbers correspond to imagining that the vector was starting from coordinates 0, 0, 0 from the world, from the origin of coordinates. If that was where the vector started, which again, it doesn't have to be there because vectors don't have location. But if that was the case, then these three numbers would represent the coordinates of the point where the tip of the arrow would end. Or if you want to, um, or if this is easier to, for you to understand this way, the X and Y and C location, uh, coordinates represent the length of the vector in the projection of X, the length of the vector in the projection of Y, and the length of the vector in the projection of C. Whatever, that, um, whatever, whatever uh, resonates better with you. So for instance, for example, if we had a point that was in coordinates, I'm going to say, I don't know, 3, 7, and 2, all right? And then we had a vector such as this, which 
and the vector was a vector 2, 0, 0, all right? That vector is not really located in the origin. It doesn't really have an or, uh, a location. But what would be the coordinates of the point at the tip of the arrow in this case? Well, it would be whatever the coordinates of the original point were plus the coordinates of the vector. So this point here would be on coordinates 5, 7, and 2. All right? But the vector can be used interchangeably anywhere. Wonderful. So um, shall we go back to Grasshopper and then take a look at how vectors are created and handled in the software? Let's go take a look. Inside of Grasshopper, um, most of the, all of the vector operations are actually found under the vector tab. And there's a bunch of categories. There's grid, there's planes, points, which we will see very soon. And most of them are actually here on the vector category. So the simplest forms of vectors that I can think of are unit vectors, for example, in the x direction, are unit vectors in the y direction, or are unit vectors in the z direction. And if I plug in a panel here, you can see that this is a vector of the form 1, 0, 0. So one unit in the x direction, this will be one unit in the y direction, and this will be one unit in the c direction. If you notice also, Grasshopper is very smart in dropping the components here already without any pre-visualization. And if I turn it on, I can't really turn the visualization on. It just doesn't work because vectors on their own can actually not be visualized. They have to uh, they, they cannot visualize on their own because they don't have a location in three-dimensional space. So the way I can visualize vectors is, for example, by going to the display tab here and going to vector and using vector display on vector display extended. So I'm going to use the simple one, vector display. I'm going to place this here and I'm going to see that the inputs, uh, it asks me for the vector that I want to preview, that's V, and then it asks me for an anchor point to preview the vector, which is kind of interesting because I have to artificially tell it where I want the vector to start. And with that additional information, then Grasshopper can actually show me that vector somewhere. And you can also notice that this component is a little special because it doesn't have outputs. The only thing that it does is it shows up stuff visually on the canvas. So for example, I can try to visualize the X component. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to drop a point here. I'm going to bring that point into Grasshopper, and then I'm going to use it as the anchor. And you can see that as I zoom in here, you can see that I have a, a point that is a vector that is represented on top of this point. Or if I were to, for example, just drop a, um, a, a radial grill, uh, a radial grid here, you could see that if I plug all of these points, all of these points here, I can have all of these, I can have all of those vectors represented on top of the points of my radial grid, for example. Or, and that can be unit X, that can be unit Y, or those can be unit Z in the C direction. Uh, that's kind of cool, actually, huh? All right, so another thing that I can do is, um, I can, I don't want to delete that point. I want to bring it here. So another thing that I can do is I can generate, I can generate vectors numerically through their X, Y, Z components. So for example, I'm going to create here a vector X, Y, Z, and I'm going to give it, for example, oops, not, I'm going to say 10.00, and then I, that's going to be x component, y component, and c component. And you can see that if I now pre-visualize that vector on the point that I'm bringing in from Rhino, you can see that that vector now has no c and no y. It's just a pure x vector, and it's longer and shorter. And now it has some y component, and now it has some z component. Does this make sense? Or for example, one of the most popular ways of creating a vector, and let's take a look at what this vector looks like numerically. So that's going to be 
here, that's going to be this vector, with the coordinates 220, 289, and 3, blah, blah, blah. As you can see, neither of these two points is in these coordinates. These coordinates are the coordinates of the vector if it was placed in 0, 0, 0. Another really useful way of creating vectors is creating a vector between two points. This is a really, really common way of doing this. So, for example, I can create a vector between two points and I took one here. I could create the other one, but I could, I'm just going to do it manually in Rhino. I'm going to bring this point here and then I'm going to say I want a vector from A to B. And then I want to visualize that vector. And you can see that the vector is now going from one point to the other. All right. And what is the numerical representation of that point? Is all this decimal stuff here. What is so interesting about this? It's so interesting because since the point, the vector are the coordinates of the difference, the, are the, the vector has the coordinates of the difference between the x and y and c coordinates of each one of these two points. Because if you imagine, if we moved this from here to zero, then you can see how the coordinates of this vector are actually the same as the coordinates of this point here. But if I move them all together, then the vector is representing the differences in coordinates between the two points, which is also pretty, pretty interesting. I can also generate a family of vectors between one point and multiple points. So let's go back to, um, let's drop here another grid, for example, and then let's move this point all the way up here. If I move this point here, and this plane is kind of confusing a little bit, so let me just stick to the point. So I'm going to use the points here, and I'm going to turn off the visualization of the grid. If I create a vector, and I'm going to turn this um, if I create a vector between two points, right, and the first one is the point that I have here on the top, and the other one is the points that I have on the grid, then what I can see now is that I have a collection of all the vectors that go from point A to each one of the points on the grid. And if I visualize that, you can see that I have a nice display of projections from this one vector to the others. All right. But that is if I choose to represent these vectors starting from point A. But that doesn't have to be the case. I can choose to represent those vectors starting from the other point that I had manually here. So for example, this one here. So all these vectors are now the same vectors. They're just projecting out from this other point. Or how about to project these vectors out from each one of the points on the grid? So I'm going to take the points of the grid and I'm going to use those for anchors for each one of the vectors. So now with this, it kind of looks like it kind of looks like this point here is kind of projecting shadows on top of each one of these points, which is which correspond to the distance of the point to each one of the other points on the grid, which is kind of cool. So this kind of vectors now could be really useful to project shadows, to do sun analysis, to do reflections, or to do, for example, attraction and repulsion, to push those points uh, out or inside. You know, that could also be a really interesting application. There's even more stuff we can do. So for example, let me draw just some curve here like this and I'm actually going to click on the I'm going to click on the um, the control points so that I'm going to give it some volume so that it's more so that it's not a planar curve it's like it's in 3D. Okay? So we have this curve in three dimensions here and I'm going to bring that curve inside of Rhino. Okay? Now I have that curve and what I'm going to do is I'm going to subdivide this curve into equal length segments. And we've done this operation in many exercises before. 
I'm going to do, for example, 20 subdivisions, whatever. All right. And then typically what we were interested in were the points that we were subdividing on. But it turns out that, um, as we said before, the component gives us points at those divisions, but it also gives us the tangent vectors at those divisions points, which is actually super interesting. So let me see if I can, for example, let's say that I'm going to now take, uh, I'm going to take this vector display. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to visualize all these vectors. All right. And the anchor points that I'm going to choose for all these vectors are going to be the points on the curve. So if I do that, you can see that super interestingly, what I'm getting is the vectors on the curve that represent the tangency in three dimensional space of the curve at that point. This could be super, super useful if we wanted to, for example, make some operation where we place geometry on top of the curve and we want to make sure that that geometry is oriented in, in the direction of the tangency of the curve at that point. Super, super interesting. I have a problem though, the, it feels like the vectors are kind of small. I can't really see them well in this graphic. Why is that? Let me do, let me place a panel here to look at the vectors. And it turns out all the coordinates are smaller than one. This is because tangency on a curve is a property that where the only thing that's important in that property is the orientation, is the direction of the vector. But how long that is, it's not important. It's not a property of the curve. And then Grasshopper chooses to give you vectors that are unitary, vectors that have a length of one. How do I know that? Well, I actually know because I could go to vector and I could say, can you give me the length of each one of these vectors? And if I did that, oops, sorry, these are the vectors. And if I did that, you would see that each one of the vectors was vector uh, with an unit of one. If I go back to what I did before, which was the grid of vectors here, you can see that for this, these vectors, now each one of them has a length of whatever. Some are shorter, some are longer. But in the case of the tangency, turns out that all the vectors have a tangency and a length of one. Okay. So I'm using the vector length component to read that information, but there's another vector called amplitude that I can use to change that value. So for example, what this vector component does is it takes a vector, it takes a length, and then it gives you back the same vector, but increase or decrease to match that length that we specified. So for example, I can say all these vectors and I want them to be like super long, for example, then what I can do is I can just modify all these vectors. Now these are the coordinates and those are the vectors that I'm going to visualize now. And you can see that the vectors are longer and I can increase them and decrease them, increase them, increase their lengths or decrease their lengths. All right. How cool is this? And this technique that I am showing the finding the tangency to this curve at points can not only is not only something that I can do on curves, but I can actually do something very, very similar with surfaces. So I have just created this one surface here with a little bit of undulation. And I'm going to bring that surface back here into Rhino. So for example, surface, I'm going to bring it here, etc. right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a process that we have done before, which is to subdivide this surface into a grid of UV points. What that means is that I can subdivide that. Okay. And then I can say, well, I want, for example, 15, subdivisions in one direction and I want 15 in the other direction so that I have a few more points. So if you remember when we were looking at this component, we saw that the surface gave the, the component gave us the division points. So those that we can see here, but another thing that it gave us was the normal vectors 
on those points. Vectors that are perpendicular, exactly perpendicular to the surface on each one of those points. So those vectors can also be visualized using the display vector, uh, the vector display. So if I the if I visualize the vectors uh, anchored on those points, you can see that well the way I have drawn the um, the surface it looks like the normals are sticking down, but you can see how all the arrows are pointing exactly perpendicularly in the direction of the normal to the surface. And because I can set the amplitude of those vectors, so I'm just going to say, for example, those vectors need to have a value of, um, for example, and I'm going to make this slider be able to be negative, and they can have a value of positive 10 all the way to minus 10, for example. And this way, I can visualize the direction of these vectors, the direction of the normals of the surface on top of these points. This is extremely, extremely useful when we want to have a freeform surface and we want to, for example, place objects on top of them that, has, that respect the orientation of the normal. This is a really, really common operation to do. And uh, so finding the normals on a surface is a really, really useful technique, giving us a vector that then we can use to fit to other geometry processes. Okay, now vectors have a super interesting algebra behind them of operations that we can do, and uh, many of which are particular to vectors, to what's called vector algebra. Sorry to be redundant. We're not going to get very deep into those details in this video, uh, but long story short, for example, if you want to know properties uh, or you want to make simple manipulation of vectors without getting into the weeds of how that happened, you can access many of those operations here on the vector tab. So for example, there are, you can calculate between the angle, you can calculate the angle between two vectors, you can calculate the length of a vector, you can, which is actually done with the Pythagorean theorem, but um, here it's just done for you. You can rotate a vector around an axis, you can flip the direction of the vector, which is just simply changing the sign of the coordinates of that vector. And then you can do the dot product or the cross product. These two operations are fundamental to vector algebra, and they have really, really interesting properties of what they can give you and why. We're not going to get into any of those today. If you're interested in the getting into the weeds of more detailed vector algebra, I highly recommend that you check uh, my video on, <laughs> on the course that I teach at Harvard, Introduction to Computational Design, and the lecture that I talk, where I talk specifically about vectors, all their properties, and um, the algebra behind them. Um, I, it will hopefully pop up somewhere on the screen or it will be in the description of this video and if you're interested in general um, you can also check the full playlist which is all the lectures for the course now i would like to show for example one of the simplest operations that we can do which is adding two vectors together which is actually not here because well, the way we do this is with the mathematical tab all the operators addition multiplication etc all of those can actually, many of them can apply to vectors as well. So for example, here we have uh, two vectors. If you remember, the one vector was the vector that I created from the first point and the second point, which if I display it on top of this point, it gives me this vector here. And the second vector was a vector that I just created straight from x, y, z coordinates. And if I plot it on top of the second point, you can see that it looks something like this. And from a coordinate standpoint, if I take a look at the numbers that define the first vector and the numbers that define the second one, they look something like that, all right? Well, turns out that I can add two vectors together, for example, with the addition component in the operators, and then I can plug that one in, that second one in, and I can see the result, which if I add it to this panel, you can see it's difficult to see, but more or less you can see that the x coordinate is the addition of the first two, the y coordinate is the addition of 7 plus 2, and the c coordinate is 3.9 minus 0.78 or something like that. 
All right. So addition is just simply adding the x coordinates together, the y coordinates together, and the c coordinates together. However, graphically or geometrically is a really interesting operation because if I were to to plot this vector that I just created on top of the first point, that is going to be this one here, you can see how the resulting vector, the addition, is basically putting one after the other and then joining the, the start point of the first one with the end point of the second one, which is a super, super interesting property and is extremely useful for doing a lot of operations like vector modification, moving points around, moving vectors. So really, really, um, it's a really, really basic and useful operation. Again, if you're interested in more details about vector operations and what they mean, make sure to check this lecture if you have the time and you're interested. Okay. In the same spirit, I would like to highlight another super interesting property of vectors, and this time in relation to points, for example. And it is the fact that if you think about this carefully, um, vectors are represented by three numbers, whereas points are also represented by three numbers, which means that at the end of the day, both are just three numbers. And the only thing that makes them different is how we computationally or geometrically, how we interpret them. So one of them, we think of it as location in 3D space. The other one, we think of it as an arrow pointing in a particular direction with a particular magnitude. But in a way, since they're just three numbers for the computer is the exact same thing. And therefore, a lot of the algebra is shared between the two. And in a way, they can be used interchangeably between each other. So for example, whatever I can plug in a point, I will be able to plug in a vector because basically the three coordinates of the vector will be taken as a location in 3D space and vice versa. But at the same time, I can also operate with them between each other. So for example, if I have a point in three dimensional space and I have this one vector that I have defined using three numbers, I can represent the vector just by plotting that vector anchored on that original point. But it turns out that if I add these two objects together, if I take the point and I add, let me actually plug a panel so that we can see these two. The point is three coordinates, which uh, fortunately they don't show up here. And the other one is two, three coordinates as well. Turns out that if I add the two together, then what happens is that the coordinates of one get added to the coordinates of the second one. And what happens is that this point now, instead of being in the coordinates that it was, it has new coordinates, which are the original ones plus the X, Y and C coordinates of the vector. And therefore, I have a new point that is at the tip of the vector that I located at the original point. So in a way, adding a point and a vector graphically and geometrically, what it means is moving the original point, but in a direction and with a magnitude that is equal to the vector that I am adding to it. So a point and a vector added together is just the same as moving is kind of the same as moving a point in three dimensional space, which is also a super, super interesting property that we will use really, really extensively. All right. Well, so this was vectors in a nutshell. As you can see, there's actually a lot of depth in what it, when it comes to doing vector algebra and vector operations. But I would like to to put a pin on that one before we get into the nitty gritties. And but again, if you are called to learning more about that, I highly recommend you check my lecture where you can see a breakdown of like the properties of the dot product, the cross product and why it's interesting and what do you get, etc. And the geometrical and numerical relationships. But otherwise, if maybe we're not there yet, if we're beginning, so perhaps what we can do is we can learn more about how vectors can be really useful for us, just doing some practice exercises farther down in this series of 
videos, okay? Which is what we're going to do. So this is going to be vectors for the time being. We're going to see them. They're going to come back all the time in all the videos that we're going to see. And I think we're ready to move on to the next topic, if you, which I think is going to be planes. So if you think you like this video, maybe consider hitting the like button, hitting subscribe if you want to learn more, turning on notifications to see when we go live, when do we publish videos. And in the meantime, um, hopefully see you on the next video. Thanks a lot.